Hi, everyone. We welcome you and thank you for joining us to today's Safety and Health webinar sponsored by KPA. Just letting you know as you file in, we're going to allow a little more time for that, get things going in about a minute from now. But again, thank you for joining us. Hello again, we welcome you all to today's Safety and Health webinar sponsored by KPA. Letting you know as you file in, gonna allow just about 30 more seconds for, for everyone to get settled and get going in another 30 seconds. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast, Fixing a Broken Safety Culture, sponsored by KPA. My name is Kevin Drulli. I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and we'll be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. In a few minutes, we'll start a presentation, but first, let's review some preliminary items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and may not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not necessarily mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply click the Q&A button on, at the bottom of your screen, type your question, and click the Send button. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's speaker. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey. We'll let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast will be archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, please visit safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today is Jack, excuse me, Zach Pachillo. Zach is an EHS compliance manager at KPA who brings 17 years of experience in the environmental health and safety field. Zach started at KPA as an EHS consultant in 2006. His duties have included consulting, auditing, training, record keeping, loss control, and managing the EHS program for 100 plus accounts. Again, we thank you all for tuning into the presentation. Zach, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much, Kevin. And first, I'd like to go ahead and thank the uh, National Safety Council and Safety and Health Magazine for the opportunity to speak today. I'd like to thank them for the organization and promoting of this subject. So fixing a broken safety culture, that's what I'm here to talk about today. So in my 17 years of experience, I've seen a lot of different organizations out there that have told me that, oh, Zach, I want a safety culture here at my facility. And I kind of look at them as like, where, where are you at now? <laughs> what kind of culture do you have in place? And it is a long journey to go from uh, a culture where you don't have any type of safety influence on that culture to one that where we have the employees pretty much running all aspects of safety. And you can actually see it as you step foot onto the uh, actual organization's property. I've also seen it go from having a very strong safety culture to all of a sudden taking steps back as well too. And to the point where it gets to the broken portion of what I call would be broken. And that's where we've fallen all the way back to almost a reactive stage. Like things are starting to happen and now we are reacting to them instead of being proactive. So today I wanna to give some different strategies, some different tools and tips that I've seen in my experience about how if you have a broken safety culture, how you might be able to go back and get back on track with trying to make sure that you're preventing accidents, that you are going down the right path of making sure that the employee morale is high and trying to engage all of your workforce in that high priority of obtaining that culture of safety. So in today's presentation, I do have an agenda of some items I do want to talk about. First of all, let's define what is a safety culture, and that's a very difficult task to do. I want to talk about a cultural ladder as well, too. I've done some research on this recently, and I used to think of culture in, when it comes to safety in three different aspects. But really, after do, reading a research paper, it's kind of changed my mind. I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, then there's the three pillars of safety pretty much in an organization that I feel like are the there, there are three elements that are the pillars of a safety foundation. 
if you're trying to achieve a higher level of culture where safety is definitely influential in there, all three of these pillars need to be in place as you move on that cultural ladder journey. So follow along with me. If you have questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A. We'll try to get to those at the end. I have a lot of material to cover, so I'm going to kind of jump right into it. What is a safety culture? I hear that term quite often. I'm going to use it today. I'm not the biggest fan of the term safety culture, though. Uh, it's a buzzword to me. It's one of those words that really has taken effect with senior management leaders, and it's a request, it's a desire that I want a safety culture here in my workplace. So I kind of went onto the web and looked at, okay, what is the definition of a safety culture? And, you know, I scoured the internet and found five different definitions that I put here on the screen. So first off, interactions between people's psychology and work behavior in the organization. Okay. Number two, observations of the efforts of an organizational members, which draws their attention towards daily safety improvement. Sounds like a good one to me. Number three, all elements of organizational culture that affect the behaviors and attitudes associated with increase or decrease risks. Okay, we're getting there. There's a couple of terms now we're starting to um, be redundant here, behaviors. All right, so let's keep that in mind. Uh, to direct people's activities towards risk, accidents, and prevention is required to share and understand all related definitions, experiences, and safety perceptions. So definitions, experiences, behaviors. Uh, so we're starting to get kind of a, a more of a general definition here, I believe. And then the safety cultures consist of shared beliefs, practices, and attitudes that exist at an establishment. Culture is the atmosphere created by those beliefs, attitudes, which shape our behavior. There's that key word again, behavior. And I think that's what we're really trying to change when it comes to the actual safety culture. But like I said, I don't really like that term. Nobody has a safety culture. Your, your goal is not a safety culture. You already have a culture in place. Your goal should be to make sure that safety is a part of your culture. So let's take a look at the term culture. So if we go into the Webster dictionary that is out there, culture is an umbrella term which encompasses the social behavior, institutions, the norms found in human societies, as well as the knowledge, beliefs, arts, laws, customs, capabilities, and habits of an individuals in these work groups. So think about your workplace organization today. What type of culture do you have at your workplace? You have to think about it. You have social behaviors that are out there already in your employee staff. There's institutions out there. There are norms. You know, there's also different societies. There could be little cliques within your, your organization. It could be cliques in different departments that are out there. Uh, it could be friendship group, groups that are out there or just, you know, some type of common norm. Uh, there's also beliefs that are out there. What is the belief of the organization might be a different belief for the employees. Is the belief this is just a job for me or is the belief this is a career for me? You know, of course, senior management is going to put out beliefs out there, missions and visions and strategies, but does the rest of the organization fall behind in that belief as well, too? What are the arts? What are the laws? What kind of procedures? Do you actually have great procedures and policies in place when it comes to the laws? What are the customs? You know, uh, is there frequent water cooler breaks that are out there? Is it a custom where the senior management team goes around and talks to employees one by one on a day-to-day -day basis to really get to know them? Or do they stay at that high level in the C-suite and rarely come out? What are the capabilities of this culture? What are the habits of the individuals of these groups as well, too? And that's where we can start to take a look at, you know, the habits. What are the safety habits? Where are we land at on a cultural ladder? Where's our scale at? Are we, are we in an habitual uh, type of trend where nobody's wearing personal protective equipment on the job? Are we, do we have a habit of, of uh, bypassing safety protocols? So we have to take a look at all of these things and that is our culture. So you have to figure out where, what your culture is and is safety a part of that? When I first started getting into this, I looked at, you know, a safety culture is, you know, you're either in one of these three categories, you're complacent, you're compliant, or you're, you know, you have what we call a safety culture. Safety is a part of your culture. Complacency, meaning you're fine with not doing anything where you're at. Your organization may be productive, but could be at high level risk for regulation fines, high risk for injuries, incidences, incidents lead to reputation issues, also loss of, you know, 
compensation when it comes to workers' compensation, insurance claims go up. So you're at a high level of risk when you're at that complacent mode. Maybe you fall into the compliant category with your culture. Well, we're just going to do enough to be regulatory compliant. I've seen a lot of different industries or different companies that are like this, where they are going to follow, you know, your OSHA regulations, your EPA regulations, but that's kind of at the bare minimum. Let's just check the box, make sure we're compliant. That way the big bad OSHA officer doesn't come in and cite us, which they're really not bad people. Um, <clears throat> that's just a bad perception of them. Or then there's that cultural phase where, oh, we're going above and beyond. After doing some more research, I feel like there's way many, there's a lot more stages when it comes to a cultural ladder that involves safety. And so um, there's this professor, P Professor Patrick Hudson of the Center of Safety Research uh, out of Leiden University, which I believe is in the Netherlands. And he talks about how culture is a long, hard, and winding road. You don't go from one stage of a really bad culture where the safety is not a part of it at all to overnight, you know, the employees are completely running your shop toolbox talks and we're doing near miss reports overnight. We are really, really engaged with all employees. It does not happen that way. You know, if anybody tells you that it does happen that way, they're lying. <laughs> they haven't dealt with people. They haven't dealt with an organization. So you have to actually look at culture as a ladder. You want to progress throughout the ladder if you want to actually take this journey. So you're probably starting off on the pathological side. Maybe you're at the reactive side, especially if you're beginning to embark on a safety journey here, but you want to get it to the generative side. So we have to think about this as a stair step or a ladder. So let's get into actually explaining what each step is. So you have to think about where do we fall in to do this cultural ladder with our current organization, and then how do we make the climbs to the next rungs? So let's take a look at each one. The pathological stage. That is the belief that accidents are caused by stupidity, inattention, and even willfulness on the parts of the employees. The language messages from high still reflect the organization's business aims, and then we tack on the words, the phrase, and be safe. You know, Make sure that we're turning over production. We want higher profit margins. So you need to produce, you know, 10,000 widgets this month and be safe about it. It's not really, you know, a belief in safety at that point. If you try to tell that to employees, you know, that last and be safe, those last three words go right in one ear and right out the other. So um, on the pathological stage, we're not really doing anything. Uh, we need to make sure that we are taking taking a look at where we're at and realizing we have the highest level of risk here. We need to actually start to, on this journey to take the next step. The next step is the reactive stage, and then safety becomes priority after an accident has already happened. So you may have some programs in this in place at this point. Maybe you're even doing some training, but nobody's really following through. We're not any doing anything to be proactive about trying to prevent workplace injuries, incidents, anything like that. So we're reactive to everything that does happen. And I know a lot of organizations that actually fall into that stage. That's where, hey, we've checked the box when it comes to you know, our regulatory compliance, but we're not doing anything to really prevent incidents and injuries from happening. The calculative stage, we're gonna run the risk of going through the motions of safety management, but we're not gonna commit it. So we're gonna take a look and do some actual procedures, some processes, maybe we're gonna start some preventative auditing, but we're not committing fully to it at this point. It falls by the wayside. We're doing, and this is where the stage is, oh, we've done two months worth of preventative hazard identification audits. But the third month comes around and all of a sudden things start to slip by the wayside and we don't get to that audit. And then our safety committee, we have some lack of participation and everything seems to be falling apart at that point. And this is where we've made some good progress, but this is easily where we end up going to that, back to that reactive stage. Hopefully you can keep on your, this journey and then go to the proactive stage. This is where we're making the processes and systems that are now in operation truly effective. Now, the proactive organizations use their processes and systems to anticipate safety problems before they arise, and top-level management is driving safety. So this is where the C-suite has come down, and they're participating in those safety committee meetings. 
They are actually on the shop floor and they have their own personal protective equipment on as well too. And they're calling out people that don't have it on. They are investing money into your safety programs as well too. You know, we're actually doing what we can to be proactive. We're on, you know, equipment maintenance schedules. We are on, you know, a good training learning management system has been, into, been put into place, but everything is still being ran by management in this process. And then when we can make that final jump, and this is probably the most difficult one to do, that's where we have to influence and have behavioral change for employees. And we can get to that generative stage. And that's where the organization's processes and systems are firing on all cylinders. All levels of employees are driving the safety initiatives. And this is the one I like the best, this last box. The employees are running the show. Management now has the hard job of designing the show but the employees are running it, meaning the employees are out there doing the toolbox talks. The employees are doing the hazard identification audits. They're addressing the issues. They're taking them to the safety committee at that point. They're be reviewing incidences. They're calling out other employees to make sure that they are not you know, doing unsafe behaviors that are out there. There are stop work orders in process. So we are at a great stage when we reach here. But I've seen where we've fallen back on ladders like this before. Could be just a change in leadership that's out there. Could be that we had a great safety manager that was really uh, managing this entire process. And then they leave. We have somebody that comes in that may not be uh, as familiar with the operation. And we take a couple of steps back at that point. So we're continually on this ladder at all points. But we're trying to get to that generative stage at all times. So how do we get there? How do we improve ourselves and go up through these rungs? I don't have a like a flawless system that says, follow this and you're going to get there. It's a different journey for every organization that is out there. But I do have some ideas, some different tips, and that's what we'll go through now. So the pillars of safety management. One is going to be senior management commitment. We have to ensure that the senior management has bought into the safety program of what we're trying to do because that's where the money comes from. We have to invest into our safety programs. It will take some money. That's also where employee behaviors are going to be taken from as well too. How many times have you seen it where you're trying a safety initiative, you get everybody on board, then an executive comes down from the C-suite, walks to the plant floor, and they don't have their safety glasses on because they don't feel like they need them, but everybody else is wearing them. All of a sudden, Everything that you fought for to try to get people to wear their personal protective equipment has just been pretty much thrown by the wayside at that point. So we have to get that management commitment in what we're trying to do. The key to get, to get management to buy in, a lot of people have ask me all the time, how do I get safety management to, or management, uh, executive management to buy in? And so it involves finding a common purpose. And a common purpose in my eyes, usually always revolves around that almighty dollar. Let's face it, our management is responsible for making sure that they are looking profitable, revenues are up, that we are making our investors happy, that we also have great reputation out there. I think there's a lot of ESG initiatives going on right now that are driving a lot of reputation as well too. So this is a great time to try to make sure that you're employing safety by trying to get the top level management to buy in, especially if you've been getting given the task of, you know, you're uh, promoting your ESG strategies for the company. So based off of a 2022 survey result, a um, couple of questions or a couple of items came through and, you know, so does your organization prioritize safety over production and other business demands? You know, this, this was a, a survey that was sent out uh, to several different safety managers across the country. So 70% yes, 30% no. Does top management in your organization provide active and visible support for occupational safety and health? 82% yes, 18% no. And to which department does safety report? 44% uh, the executive suite. And then you can see them down below. So it looks like management is buying in for the most part to the safety initiatives of the EHS managers that are out there. You know, we're at 70%. Yes, they are prioritizing safety. 82% says that they have visible support. 44% are reporting to the executive suite. That's the one I feel like should be a higher number than it actually is. 
honestly, an EHS department should be pretty much reporting to the executive suite at all times. Uh, if they're not, we probably have a little bit of an issue, meaning there's a lot of red tape that that team has to cut through in order to get initiatives done. So let's take a look at a strategy of how to get senior management to commit to a safety initiative. Um, you know, just really installing more safety programs. It could be investing money, but really you want to go to that almighty dollar. How much is this going to cost somebody if we do nothing? If we stay in that reactive stage, if we stay in that just complacent stage, what's going to happen? So let's take a look at like a case study here. This is all make believe at this point. This is one I just kind of put together, but you can see as we go through this, it could happen in an organization. So the Bantha Blue Milk Company has a powered industrial truck on site. The facility does not have any type of forklift program or policies communicated to the employees. So one day a part needs to be delivered to a service bay for installation. A new untrained warehouse employee hops on the forklift, tries to deliver the part, and as they begin to enter the service department at high speed, the employee sees another forklift backing up and therefore has to swerve to avoid the collision. The brakes have not been functioning properly and the forklift slides a bit and starts to tip. Forklift tips over, employees attempts to jump for it. <laughs> the employee's leg unfortunately is pinned between the ground and the cage and that surrounds the driver's seat and the employee is taken to the hospital. Unfortunately, the employee's leg needed to be amputated. The part slid off the forks knocked into a 55 gallon drum of oil, which was near an overhead dock door. Part knocks the drum off the loading dock, which is a four foot ball and it ruptures and it hits the ground. The drum's contents spill onto the storm drain at the base of the dock. So if you have experience in environmental health and safety, you see several red flags throughout this whole story. <laughs> and so let's kind of take a look at some of those red flag areas. All right, so what's this going to cost senior management? You know, if we have no safety program in place, we have no forklift program in place, we have an injury like this, what, what's the look at the cost for this? So OSHA has a safety pays calculator out there. If you go to OSHA, simple Google search, you can find the safety pays calculator and you can put in different types of injury types to see what the actual direct cost estimated would be, the indirect cost, and then the estimated total cost as well too. So we're talking about an employee that tried to jump from a forklift, probably caused a fracture to the wrist, a concussion, and then an amputation. So you can see in direct costs, we're at 96,000, concussion 54,000, fracture 54,000. You know, once you factor in the indirect cost, that total cost really does jump up. And indirect costs, if you're not familiar with that, we're talking about the costs that are not the obvious medical related costs. We're talking about lost production time the cost of training another employee to now uh, fill in for the spot of this employee at this point. We're talking about possibly, you know, future premiums going up on insurance costs as well too. So if that was the case, we obviously have the medical issues that are going on, the direct cost and the indirect cost. But since it's an amputation, we have to report that to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration Usually within a 24 hour period, we have to report that. And so that's gonna trigger an investigation. And here's some citations I have taken from different citations found out there on the web through public information about very similar citations that would probably be used in a situation like this. So citation one, prior to permitting an employee to operate a powered industrial truck, the employer shall ensure that the operator has successfully completed training, you know, $5,500 fine. And that could be a lot more than what this is since it was actually an amputation that did happen. You know, all parts of the industrial truck required replacement shall be replaced. Well, the brakes weren't working properly, so we have another citation. Now we're at a willful violation. If at any time a powered industrial truck is found to be in need of repair, defective or in any way and safe, the truck shall be taken out of service, has been restored to safe operating condition. This may or may not fall under the willful category, it really depends on what prior happened with that forklift. It was, if it was known that the brakes were bad, yes, this could be a willful violation. And then industrial truck shall be examined before being placed in the service, shall not be placed in service, examination shows. So basically we're talking about an inspection. If we are knowingly not doing inspections, we can have another willful violation on top of that. 
So we're looking at about roughly $130,000 in citations from OSHA. Remember, we knocked over a 55-gallon drum. We've got to clean that up as well, too. This is where the EPA can get involved. So uh, we've seen, I've seen some settlements out there for $17,500 to settle claims regarding a spill 2000, or in 2014, an oil spill. Uh, at a facility, and it would it basically did not have an adequate oil spill prevention plan in place or an SPCC. And then there's also the citation does not include legal fees, cleanup costs, cost to upgrade the equipment, and then the cost for the actual SPCC plan that would have to be written. So we're saying another fifteen thousand dollars on top of that. That's at the low end of estimating that number. <clears throat> then let's talk about the legal costs. So at this point, the employee jumped from the forklift and they got amputated and they had their leg amputated. And so you're thinking to yourself, well, this was all the employee's fault. Well, we can't really go down that path because if we look at some real world personal injury settlements, you know, we've had a civil court verdict in the case that involved ankle injuries with the forklift where it tipped over. And that was a $350,000 settlement for the plaintiff. But if you try to say that the employee was negligent, well, OSHA will build the majority of the case for the attorney based off the investigation. There was no training, no inspections, no maintenance. If attorney sees that, I mean, pretty much case closed at that point. There's going to be a settlement more than likely. So you might be thinking to yourself, Zach, why are you going through all these numbers? Well, this is how you can show senior management that you need to invest more into your safety programs. This is how you get one of those pillars in place to make sure that senior management is buying into what you're trying to do to make sure you're moving up that cultural ladder that is out there. Because these things are all going to cost them. This is just one incident right here. So we're talking, looking at with everything added up, total cost of around $824,000 right there, but it doesn't end there. We're talking about also there's going to be insurance carriers that are going to determine premiums based off of the different past you know, insurance claims that have been out there. So insurance premiums can go up. Typically, they look at the last three years worth of injuries, and you're going to end up with what we call an experience modification rating. Now, I can't go over what that formula is because every insurance company has a different formula for how they calculate an experience modification rating. But we'll say that this one, in most cases, is going to be the industry average. And this is very similar like an incidence rate that's out there. So if you have an experience modification rating of one, you're paying on average what all your competitors are paying for insurance. If it's below one, then you're probably saving a little bit of money on your insurance premiums. If it's above one, you're probably paying more than some of your competitors down the street. So this is another way as safety professionals, we can grab the ear of our senior management to let them know, hey, our insurance premiums are something that we can still control if we have great safety programs in place, if we have a culture that adopts safety recognition as well too. And then senior management usually is competitive as well too. They wanna to make sure that they are beating their competitors. So insurance is one area of that, but also taking a look at the incidence rates as well too. Uh, this is where you can actually go to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics and get incidence rates for your particular industry. And then you can calculate your own incidence rates based off of your past OSHA 300 forms. So we're talking about you know, injuries and illnesses per 100 full-time workers. They're calculated as the number of injuries divided by the total hours worked by all employees and then multiplied by 200,000, which is the base uh, equivalent number of hours, 40 hours per week, 50 weeks per year. Mm. So an example down here, you have 160,000 um, hours out there uh, and you have in, we'll say it's four from your OSHA 300 form. So four divided by 160,000 times 200,000, we're looking at an incidence rate of 5.0. You can take that to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics website and you can compare it to your industry for the total, rec total recordable cases out there. And you can see how you actually compare with the rest of the industry out there. So if you're in food manufacturing, rate of five, you're actually doing okay and you're pretty average along the industry standard. But if you are a binary or in manufacturing or a distillery, at that point, if you have a total recorded, or if you have an incidence rate of five 
and the industry average is down around one, we obviously have some problems compared to our competitors out there. You know, also getting senior management to commit as well too by, you know, having them involved in what you're trying to do. And this is where accountability comes into place. So we can't really make move on our cultural ladder if we don't have accountability in place as well too. So an example of trying to get senior management to buy into this is having them have the authority to sit down and say like, okay, and I've seen this actually happen at a company before, the bottom performer must present improvement strategy at the next management meeting. So department A, you can see they're all doing great. Department B, department D, E, F, G, department C, we're not doing very good with our Kappa training or PPE checks. What's going on department C? And this is where senior management says, nope, we're not gonna have one department falling behind. Therefore, department C at the next strategy meeting, you have to actually let us know what your plan is to get caught up with the rest of the departments here. And so it's almost like a, a accountability by a little bit of humiliation as well too. It does work. And it does actually get those departments to actually start to focus on what they're supposed to be doing and actually implementing those safety strategies as well too. Another pillar that is out there. So we say we put all those strategies in place, we've got senior management bought in, we're going with this. We also need employee engagement as well to climb this cultural ladder. We've got to change behaviors that are out there. We've got to look out for the coyotes and we actually have to make sure that we are communicating to our employees using the best practices possible. But first you have to understand your audience. What type of audience do you have? And I think generation, looking at different generations is probably one of the better ways to go when it comes to your safety initiatives that are out there. So here's some statistics that come from Purdue University uh, from an infographic. We've got the different age generations out there that are in the workforce. We still have baby boomers. There's generation X, millennials, and generation Z. Your baby boomers were on the far end of the spectrum when it comes to their careers. They're about phased out at this point, but there's still some that are out there. Um, in fact, there's about 65% of baby boomers who plan, they are, there are 65% of the baby boomers plan to work past the age of 65. So if you're born between 1946 and 1964, you're in that baby boomer uh, category. And, you know, take a look at the employer's should statement at the bottom of each one of these boxes. So, Provide them with specific goals and deadlines. Put them in mentor roles and offer coaching style feedback, which I think is great types of initiatives for the baby boomer class, mentor roles especially. Generation X, 1965 to 1980. And employers should give them immediate feedback, provide flexible work arrangements, work-life balance, extend, extend opportunities for personal development. Millennials, that's my category right there or 1981 to 2000. Employers should get to know them personally, manage by results, be flexible in their schedule and work assignments, provide immediate feedback. I'll, I'll, I'll say it out there, I thrive on great immediate feedback, you know, um, which is all not great, I should say that, but <laughs> I thrive on immediate feedback. I wanna know how I'm doing all the time. Am I hitting the mark? Am I missing the mark? Am I going down the right path or am I way off on some tangent over here? And so cater to that with your millennials that are out there. And then Generation Z, 2001 to 2020. Offer opportunities to work on multiple projects at the same time, provide work-life balance, allow them to be self-directed and independent. So you notice as we get out of that baby boomer stage, work-life balance becomes very important in each one of these other generations that are out there. And so we actually took note of that during that pandemic where we had a lot of different remote work sessions going on. And a lot of companies have just switched over to remote work at this point. They haven't come back to the office because it helps these two generations with that work-life balance a little bit more that's going on out there. We have to pay attention to the younger workforce though, because they are the ones that are causing more of the injuries. So some NIOSH statistics that are out there. In 2020, there were about 17.3 million workers under the age of 25. These workers represented 11.7% of the total workforce and 352 workers under the age of 25 died from work-related injuries. 26 deaths to workers under the age of 18 and at a rate of work-related injuries treated in emergency departments for workers ages 15 to 24 was one and a half times greater 
than the rate for workers 25 years of age and older. So we've got to take a look and focus on that younger generation. This may not be, you know, working in your organization may not be their career, but we have to find that out. And we have to find out how we can help them on their path so that they can buy in what you're trying to do as an organization as well, too. It's kind of a you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours type of thing. So when you're going to look at strategies to engage the employees, you know, lead by example and empower the people. Seek out your team. You know, don't just throw a safety culture ID on someone else's lap. You know, if you're the EHS director, if you're the senior management, if you're the C-suite, you need to actually form an actual team together. Don't just say, hey, human resources manager, you need to change our safety culture here. You need to make it better. Go do it. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> you're taking somebody that has no experience in this whatsoever, at least on the safety side, and trying to, you know, make that round peg fit in the square hole. We need to actually work as a team together. There are several different departments that have to come together. Volunteers are going to be better than voluntolds as well, too. So always try that strategy first. You know, issue your team the time and make considerations for any type of misproductivity that's out there as well, too. Uh, recognize your current status of where you're at on that cultural ladder that we talked about and analyze what you need to do to get to the next step. Also, take a look at your inside resources that you have available to you. You know, take a look at your team. If we're going to expand our team, and maybe this is the safety committee we're talking about. Okay, we have a technician who is a past forklift operator for a shipping firm. They should probably be a part of your safety committee meeting at that point or be on your safety team, and they can be a person that really helps you out with your forklift operator training program. Or our shop foreman is willing to share stories about how she has seen hand tools slip before and can do a shop talk. Awesome. You know, that's where we want to make sure that we're definitely engaging that and utilizing that to the best of our ability. And maybe not only just doing a shop talk, but also maybe designing some infographic posters that could go up around the facility. You know, we have a former firefighter that is now a parts delivery man. They should be a part of your safety initiative as well, too. You know, how can we utilize their talents from uh, former careers to help with your initiatives now at your organization? You know, people will bring in ideas such as the local Red Cross host CPR basic first aid training. You know, we've never really done first aid training here. We've always relied on 911. But how long, how long is it really going to take 911 to get to us? If it, you know, we're talking this is going to be like, you know, 10 minutes because <laughs> we're out in a rural destination. We should probably have a first aid team on site. So you can see some more of these. I'm going to, for the sake of time, we're going to keep on moving here. But also... You know, display some vulnerability as well. You know, I've done this several different times. And if I'm trying to make a behavioral change, getting attention uh, is a tough thing to do. And I've started out several times where, hey, guys, I'm Zach Pacello. I'm your new EHS consultant. I want to work with you on safety initiatives. So I want you to wear your personal protective equipment, and I want you to be safe out there. Everybody's going to roll your eyes at that. You know, hey guys, I'm Zach Pacello. And yeah, I'm an EHS consultant, but let's talk a little bit about some other things that are out there. Is everybody good today? Good? Me? No, I'm not good. I'm going through some personal things at home. You know, um, I've got kids that are just driving me nuts. We've got sports that are going on, and I'm playing chauffeur every single night and, you know, trying to coach. And some parent got into it with me the other day and had to, have a calm conversation over on the sideline to try to get everybody's nerves under and cool and collected. Has anybody ever been a part of that before? You know, that displays the vulnerability right there. I'm not going right into the safety initiatives. I'm talking about something else where I might be able to share a story with somebody and collect them in because we share, you know, maybe that we coach Little League or something like that. So try a different strategy when it comes to that. Try a little bit of vulnerability that is out there. Everybody should have a stop work authority approval as well, too. So this is empowering the employees. And the, if you don't have this already in place, I highly recommend that you put it in place. And that is where if an employee sees something unsafe, they have the ability to stop work right there under no penalty or harm to, to, to them later on. You know, representation from all employees across all different uh, shifts, all different departments should be on all safety program decisions. Challenge them to create new ways of learning. Equip them with incentive power. 
you know, creation of a safety program out there, safety rewards. It's the little coin up here, you know, I've actually used those in the past as well, too, where it's like, you know, safety is our overriding priority. You can go to different companies out there and have coins made up that have your logo on there. But I've been in cases where or at organizations where they've had managers hand out those coins, but it has to be like a really special rare event that they did this. Can't be like just handing out coins every day or else it just it all of a sudden becomes white noise to employees. But a real rare special thing that you hand a coin over and say, that action right there shows me that you are a leader in what we're trying to accomplish with our safety initiatives. I want you to take this. This is very rare that we hand these out. So please take this. And uh, we're very proud of what you're doing with that. That really means a lot to people, honestly. It's better than a pizza party. It's better than a, you know, a hundred dollar gift card drawing or anything like that. It's really that recognition and that pat on the back that they're doing a great job. And that is where that whole positive reinforcement comes from. Embrace technology as well, too, since we're talking about the younger generation that is out there. <clears throat> we got to get the safety message across. You know, there's lots of different technologies that are out there. You know, <clears throat> one of the things that my company has a platform for we have mobile apps as well, too. If you think about it, we have a question of the day uh, type of software in our mobile application. Do you imagine if all the members of your workforce had a mobile app where there was a push notification that came up and said, answer, here's the question of the day, make sure you answer it. And maybe that's where they get in on the drawing later on in the month for the $100 gift card. Everybody that answers this question correctly gets in on the, the drawing. And so question one. Where is the spill control kit for staging area one located at? And you can design these questions. You know, the employee gets it correct. All of a sudden, real-time results come back to the EHS manager. And at that point, if we have 100% of our employees complete that and they're all 100% correct, awesome. <laughs> We're doing a great job with our, question, our training on spill control. But if we get the responses back that only 25% of the employees knew where that was at, we have something we need to educate them. Also, in embracing technology, there's a lot of different mobile applications that are out there that can be downloaded, and pretty much majority of these are all free. You know, you have the NIOSH Safety Ladder app. I use that all the time myself at home, especially. And so that is a, an app that you can actually take your phone, put it on a ladder, and it'll tell you if that ladder, that extension ladder, is at the right angle to make sure it's set up safely so it doesn't slip out from the actual user. Uh, with all the heat emphasis going on right now across the country, you know, we're on the brink of having a heat illness standard federally initiated, but NIOSH and OSHA created a heat app where you can actually immediately get the heat index for your area where you have your phone at. Harness Hero, it's a game actually. <laughs> and, um, it's a game that you can design a harness and a fall protection setup. And then you can almost like push this little stick figure guy off of this ledge with his harness and lanyard that you set up. And if you set it up correctly, he gets saved. If you didn't set it up correctly, I'll let you <laughs> think about what actually happens there. Uh, the NSC has a first aid app that's out there. Uh, everybody should have a first aid app on their phone that they can pull up and help administer first aid in you know emergency medical situations. That doesn't replace first aid training, but it is something that can be a useful tool. NIOSH has a PPE tracking app. They also have a chemical pocket guide. There's the emergency response guidebook that's out there. And if you're actually studying for like a safety exam, I've actually used this one. So Bowen EHS is a company. I did some studying through them and they actually have a, a, a exam pro where you can actually get 10 questions out there related to what, like a CSP type of exam. So you can see kind of, if you're like working towards one of those, it'll help you, uh, you know, kind of see where you're at on that scale of how much more you need to study. <clears throat> There's also lots of different software platform services that are out there. You know, you can do all this type of data crunching. You can have LMSs set up, learning management systems where you can have all these different training courses. And then you can actually keep track of how many employees are completed that, how many are expired, how many are active. Uh, you can have hazard identification correction. There's even different software services where you can put a QR code on a piece of equipment. An employee walks up, scans it, they get taken to a specific inspection that they need to complete on that piece of equipment to ensure that the maintenance has been done accordingly. Or they could scan it and they can see the safety procedures 
for that actual piece of equipment. So this technology is out there already. It can be utilized. And now it's just a matter of going out there and finding out which one works best for your organization. So like I talked about with vulnerability earlier and engaging them, you know, what's their realistic career goals? Talk to, you know, those younger generations out there. How can you help them, you know, make their importance known and empathize with what they are going through as well, too? 40% of Gen Zers want daily interactions with their boss or they think they've done something wrong. So that's a statistic that I believe is actually very correct. Reassurance is a thing that the society really, really wants today and the younger people that are out there. Identify coyotes, separate them from the pack of what you're trying to accomplish as well too. Every time that you try an initiative, there will always be coyotes. <clears throat> and those are the people that are going to try to tear down what you're doing. They're going to roll your eyes at everything that you're saying. They're not going to be on board. And especially let's use personal protective equipment. You might have personal protective equipment initiatives of everybody wearing it, but this person just won't do it. And they say, oh, it's another one of those safety initiatives. Don't worry, you, need to, you don't need to worry about doing it. They'll, they'll forget about this initiative in a month anyway, and nobody will care. That's a coyote right there. And you got to separate them out. How do you try to change their minds? What can you do with them? At that point, you've got to try to turn around their philosophy of what they're trying to get done, which has become a, pretty much a cancer to your organization. And so what you want to do is I recommend like take them out to lunch, you know, explain what you're trying to do, really focus some individualized attention on them, give them the spotlight and say, why don't you want to do what we're trying to do? And they'll probably give you some reasons and you need to be ready to counteract those reasons. You know, have some numbers to back up. You know, maybe it's in the pocketbook that they uh, really want to get incentivized. So if they're in a management position, you can talk about potential bonuses for, you know, being on board with what they're trying to do as well, too. And then create opportunity for people as well. Assign them on leads as tasks. You know, you can't do it all yourself as an EHS manager. You have to actually rely on other people. And remember, as you're designing training and different initiatives, you know, listening to lectures, you're probably all retaining, if you're a Gen Zer, you're only probably retaining about 12% of what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> Seeing things done, 38%, but working examples, you know, doing drills out on the floor, taking a field trip out on the plant floor to a piece of machinery and actually having them go through those motions while somebody watches them. Working examples, they learn 50% through that style. And then finally, a proactive design. So I'm going to try to really summarize this one as much as possible for the sake of time. Uh, but we got to take a look at leading indicators and lagging indicators. And really, you have to make sure that you are setting up to be proactive with the leading indicators. Lagging indicators mean we are reactive. Leading indicators meaning we're proactive. We're looking at risk assessments, hazard assessments, doing employee training, having safety committee meetings attended, employee suggestions. Lagging indicators mean things have already happened and we're trying to react to those. So a good process is the plan, do, check, act model. You're gonna put a plan into place, do the plan, check to see if it's working, and then act upon it to see what kind of actual improvements you need to make to it. So getting into an actual example, we wanna measure um, you know, safety training program. Let's measure a safety training program. Let's say that January 1st, 2021, we're gonna start this off, so a couple years ago, but. Uh, we're going to create a risk assessment to determine the courses. Let's use an actual sit-down classroom style to ensure completion. And the courses will be taught by a combination of line leads with experience. So set a SMART goal as your overall vision. And that SMART goal would be like, we will achieve 100% safety training completion and four safety courses by March 1st. So we're specific, we're measurable, we're accountable, we're reasonable, we're timely. We're going to choose tool safety, eye injury prevention, forklift operator, and lift safety. What you do then is you initiate. And then about one month later, you take a look at your progress and see, okay, what's going on here? Well, we're doing great in three courses, but forklift is not doing very well. Well, why aren't we progressing in forklift? Well, it requires a driver's practice test. Forklift is not available for practice, and the department managers are unaware of the test. If you've got somebody from the C-suite sitting in that meeting, they're probably like, hey, set up time frames for obstacles. Uh, you know, for, in obstacles area for forklift practice. 
you know, let's review the forklift testing requirements with the supervisor team as well, too. Let's solve this reason why we can't get this forklift operator training up and get it caught up with everybody else. Another example, <clears throat> you know, improving the percentage of hazards abated in the same week they were identified to 85% by April 1st. So this is another type of proactive initiative you could have out there. You know, and so you're trying to abate these hazards. And, and so you've identified so many of them. You know, we've debated 62%, 38% have not been abated. Why are we not improving to 85% goal? Well, at halfway point, we're coming up with these reasons. Tasks are not assi are assigned to the maintenance team only who have been busy with snow clearing. Approval for spending on hazard correction is a multi-step process due to the purchase orders. So solution, appoint a hazard correction team so the maintenance team doesn't have to do it all. Establish a credit card for safety spending with a set limit. Now, our roadblocks are cleared out of the way. Let's get to that 85%. So there's all different kinds of leading indicators that can be measured out there. We've got percentage of supervisors who attend mandatory safety meetings, average score on safety survey questions, uh, number of worker reported hazards or concerns for which employers initiated corrective action within 48 hours. So these are all different types of examples that are out there. And here's some more, participating in toolbox talks, uh, uh, safety perception survey participation rate, participating in accident investigation teams, and helping identify, implement corrective actions and eliminate hazards. You can measure each one of these. So those are some different strategies and here's some more as well too. That was spelled out a little bit more. I'm not gonna go into these as I'm sure we could probably get these slides out to anybody that does want them. But to summarize, when it comes to fixing the safety culture, you gotta have those, you gotta identify where you're at on that cultural ladder and then understand where you want to go as a team as well too. And really that generative model should be where everybody wants to be at. And then you gotta take a look at your three pillars of safety, your senior management, engagement of employees, and then also making sure that you're communicating effectively as well too uh, with a proactive design in your plan. So those four or those three pillars that are out there, focus on those, and then it'll start to come together with, you know, advancing up that cultural ladder. So I think that's it for my content today. I wanted to, you know, I, we might have a time for one or two questions. So I wanted to open it up there. Well, excellent. Great job, Zach. Thanks for sharing your insights and expertise. Before we do dive into the Q&A, just want to let everyone know about the evaluation survey that we're asking you to complete. The survey will open in a different screen after the webinar. We appreciate your input. It's, it's very important and it helps us improve our future webcasts. With that, let's get into our Q&A. First, does calculating IR create a generative safety, I'm sorry, a generative culture of safety care? Uh Calculating the instance rate, it's not going to get you to that generative status. No, it's going to be a helpful tool. It's going to help you understand where you're at. So if you have an incidence rate of, say, like five incidents, uh, then it's going to help you determine, okay, this is a tool that we can use to, as a leading indicator or as an indicator to measure that. We want to actually reduce our incident rate from five down to three, and then you put in strategies to determine how you're going to get there. And that will help you with moving up that ladder as well, too. So it's not going to just, you know, calculating your incidence rates is not going to get you to an actual spot on the ladder. It's not going to take you to there. But if you can reduce that and put in strategies to reduce that and make sure that everybody is on board with what you're trying to do, that's where you're influencing that behavioral change. And that's where you can climb that ladder out. Well, thank you. Um, next question asks, isn't it better to get rid of coyotes because they influence the good workers? That's a good one. I would try to change their opinions first. They are influential people typically. They're, they're actually leaders is what they are, but they're leading in the wrong direction. Uh, what they do is they can influence other people to kind of follow them. And that's, of course, what we want to not do. So I would try to at least try to, you know, influence them to come over to your side of your initiatives and what you are trying to accomplish. Sit down, talk with them, figure out what their goals are and work with that as well too. You know, cater to them, they cater to you a little bit and compromise. If they are completely unwilling to compromise at that point, do you really want them to be a part of your organization? Probably not, because they're not gonna be on board with whatever you wanna do. So at that point, you do have to make a tough decision, but at least try to get them on board and influence them to come over to your side first. 
how would you approach building a better safety culture with a short-term workforce? Employees that conduct field work on a project specific, they're getting into kind of their specifics. They're saying yep. employees that conduct field work on a project specific basis, assignments are typically one to six months long. Yeah. So you have to establish in your normal organization first that culture there. And then once they come in, you have to have a great orientation program that is probably attended by a majority of the department leads that you normally have there that are on your long-term workforce. And then the short-term workforce comes in and sees like, hey, guys, if you're not going to get on board with what we're trying to do, you're not going to be here. You know, that's where a lot of this contractor stuff comes in with those ESG initiatives as well, too. Nobody wants to have a bad rating out there. They don't want to be like, oh, we weren't turned down for jobs because we would not follow the safety initiatives of this company. Um, and so, you know, that kind of perception can really go a long way as well, too. But really, it boils down to that whole orientation as they're coming on site to your, you know, collaborative operation really hammering home that if you're not going to follow what we're trying to do here, you're going to be out real quickly. How do you, in fact, know if the safety culture is broken? Are there any signals? There's there's never going to be any type of like red flags. Like there, there will be red flags, I'm sorry, but there's never going to be any type of like switch that's like, oh, it's, you know, great to broken. <laughs> Um, there's going to be signs along the way. And that's where, you know, you really have to be observant of what's going on. You know, coyotes definitely coming out of the woodwork is definitely going to be a red flag. You know, losing that senior management commitment where we have, you know, people from the C-suite coming down and, you know, not actually abiding by the different policies that you put into place. All of a sudden, if safety training is falling by the wayside as well, too, in the different departments that are out there, that's obviously going to hit a take a hit on the safety program. So really ensuring that attendance is kept up at all different types of safety meetings, that training is going on as well, too, with 100% completion rate. Once those numbers all start to dip on the data, which you should be tracking a lot of this data, like how much, how many safety committee meetings are we having? How many have been attended by full participation? What are our training numbers that are out there? Once you start to see those numbers dipping uh, or lowering or decreasing, those are big red flags that we have a problem going on out there. And also the other data is your incidents rates, your injury uh, risk rates start to climb as well too. Have you ever tied turnover rate as an indicator of culture and measure to help get the C-suite's attention to safety? I can be. Uh, I, I, I won't dismiss that. I mean, there can be lots of different reasons out there for turnover. It could be, uh, it could be you know, based off of salary. It could be based off of the management that is in place. But it definitely can be a factor as well, too, that you need to get the attention. I, I would definitely use that as a data number because – with the generation Gen Z that is out there and also Gen, I'm sorry, the millennial generation that is out there, they value safety in their job day-to-day -day lives. They value that the company has initiatives, has a vision, and safety is also a part of that as well, too. And so they're going to go work for a different company that has better safety initiatives out there if they feel like there are none that are going on at the current workplace. So if you put it in that type of perspective, then, yeah, I would definitely say you could use turnover rates uh, to try to get the attention of the C-suite. Well, thank you. Looks like we've got time for, for one more. Uh, yep. This question asks, what are your thoughts of effectively engaging new hires to be a part of good safety culture and use good safety behavior? I think it really boils down into that orientation that you have with new hires and that whole mentorship as well, too. You know, using the people that could be still in that baby boom phase as a mentor to come in because they can share stories. And let's face it, when we're all in that young phase, we all think that we are superhuman and nothing's ever going to happen bad to us. And when we see the consequences or stories and hear about what's happened to, you know, a co you know, a worker in the past that maybe this baby boomer had, you know, experienced there, there was an actual severe injury on just a random day. They can actually share that story and that can be very impactful and very powerful to a new hire as well too having all the different department managers come into the new hire orientation and having them talk about the safety initiatives of this organization is very powerful as well too because they need to see that every department is on board with that and of course having the you know top level management come into that orientation as well too and basically kind of lay down some groundwork at, 
you know, basically, if you're not going to be, once again, kind of going back to this stage, you're not going to be on board with what we are trying to do here. You're not going to be here for very long. We take care of all of our employees. We want to make sure that they all go home at the end of the day with all 10 fingers intact, two eyes intact, and all limbs and everything. And they go home the way that they came into work. And that's a number one initiative, overproduction. And so if they hear that message, that's going to be pretty powerful. So really in that orientation and then having almost a kind of a mentorship program as well, too, to go on. So you're not just throwing those new hires right into the fire as well, too. They should be paired up and shadow somebody. And also when it comes to shadowing, it's not just sit there and watch somebody work. It's somebody watches them work for about a week or two to make sure that they are understanding all the different ins and outs of your organization. Well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Sorry that we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all today's unanswered questions will be forwarded along to Zach. And as you see there, he's got his contact information as well for anything that might pop up after the fact. Uh, once again, we hope that you take the time and fill out that forthcoming evaluation survey and really give us your, your input and your feedback. With that, we end today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. We'd like to thank Zach Pacillo, everyone at KPA, and all of you who listened in. Thanks and have a great day.